has something to say. Amen. Many times there are Christians who wonder. Many you, you meet Christians and some will say, I've been a Christian for eight years. I've been a Christian for 10 years, but nothing seems to change. Uh, Christianity does not benefit you. You are supposed to do something with your Christianity. God never intended for Christianity in itself to benefit anyone. So he, what does that mean? You are, you are not going to experience the blessings of God just because you are a Christian. You are supposed to do something with your Christianity. Amen. Amen. Let's have Romans chapter 12 from verse 2. Romans chapter 12 from verse 2. When we read the book of Romans chapter 12 verse 2, Paul talks about transformation. Many times you want to see a transformation of our lives. In different, it can be in your finances, it can be in your health, in your work of righteousness, in any area of your life. But the Holy Spirit through Paul shows us the way. He tells the Christian not to what? Not to conform to the pattern, to the fashion of this world. Meaning that this world, they have their ways of doing things. They have their ways of thinking. They have their own wisdom. But the Spirit of God says that do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. Me, he didn't say that be transformed by prayer. That he said that be transformed by a prof prophecy or someone laying his hands upon you. He says that the transformation comes by you renewing your mind. Renew your mind of what? With the word of God, with truth. Meaning that if God says that you should renew your mind, then there is a target. So then you as a Christian, the question you ask yourself is, what is that target? God says, renew your mind. Meaning that God has a target for you to reach. So what is that target? If I'm renewing my mind, to what target? What is the aim? What is the focus? Amen. There are some Christians who say that we don't know the truth. Say that nowadays there are a lot of messages going around the world. So who really is teaching the true gospel? They ask a lot of questions. It says that there can be different perspectives, there can be different uh, gospels, there can be different truth. Let's wait till Jesus what comes. Now, God tells you that one day as a Christian, you're going to give an account of everything that you did in your body. So then do you think that that God, who one day you're going to give an account doesn't want you to know the truth. But then yes, to you, one day, he has appointed one day that you are going to give an account. Then who do you think God is? I don't want you to know the truth, but one day you give an account to me. That in itself should tell you that that is not true. God indeed wants you to know the truth so that you can walk by the truth that one day you can give a faithful account to him. Amen. But the other dilemma is there are a lot of messages, so how do I know who is preaching the right message? How do I know the one who is really sent by God with his message? It's very simple. Like we said in Romans chapter 12, it says that renew your mind. It says that this true message, if you are to renew your mind with this true message, you will reach a certain target. It says that you will be transformed, but this transformation is for you to reach a certain target. Amen. And Paul then says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that talking about Christians, we have the mind of Christ. Now renewing, he's talking about renewing of your mind. Now he tells you that you have what? The mind of Christ. Meaning that in this renewal business, in this renewal programming, the target that God wants you to reach is what? Your mind. After I renew my mind with this true message, my mind should conform to the mind of Christ. Now, we all know Jesus Christ. When he walked this earth, how he walked, how he behaved. There isn't any Christian who doesn't know who Jesus what, truly is. And there isn't any Christian who, if you ask, 
a genuine Christian, as, and you say that, oh, is Jesus a sinner? Was well, Jesus sinning that any Christian would say that, oh, yes, Jesus was sometimes sinning and sometimes what? Walking righteous. For you to be a Christian, you believe that Jesus lived righteously. You believe that Jesus didn't associate himself with what? With sin. So then if any message should transform you to conform to the mind of Christ, then that message should not what? Give you what? Uh, the license to sin. Any message, if any message tells you that, oh, it's okay to sin because of grace, then you have to what? Ask yourself, this message, if I accept it and renew my mind with it, will it conform to the mind of Christ? Does it, is Christ in his mind when he walked on this earth? Was he, how did he think about sin? Will it conform to the mind of Christ? So it's very simple. Also, if someone comes and tells you that, oh, walking by faith is, is not important. Oh, you can, you can live anyhow. God understands walking by faith is not important. And the question you ask yourself is, if I accept this message and renew my mind with that message, will, will I reflect the mind of Christ? This man, this man of Galilee, when he walked throughout the land of, nation of Israel, how was he like? When he, he was confronted with sickness, how did he behave? When he was confronted with all kinds of bondages and problems, how did he react to it? Is that the same mind that this message is giving you? Amen. So then it becomes easy for you to know who is really teaching you the truth. That is, if a message that you come in contact with really comes from God, if anyone comes to you as a minister and says that, oh, my, I'm, I'm confirmed of God to, 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 uh, to bring you a message, then that message, after you accepting it and renew your mind of it, should make you more and more like Christ. Amen. Let's have Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. So any message that does not transform you to be more and more every day, like Christ, it's not from God. If that per and that does not mean that necessarily that person may not be a good Christian or that minister is not a good person. He can be a good minister, just that the message is not really confirmed by heaven. Amen. It says that for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So it says that we the Christians, God's mind, God's will, and God's purpose for us is that. We what? We conform to the image of his son. Is it the same thing he says that, that we will have? We have the mind of Christ. So now, if you receive a message and now it's transforming you to conform to the mind of Christ, then you become what? You'll be conforming to the image of his son. So that is it's very easy for any Christian who is very genuine and then will be serious with the things of God to know which message really is from God and which message is not from God. Any message which does not transform you or conform you to the image of Christ is not what? It's not from God. Amen. It's not the true gospel. The true gospel should make us more and more like Jesus. Amen. We started a series on the gospel of the kingdom. And you have, God has taught us a lot of things about this gospel. And we started by saying that many times we hear people quoting and saying that I'm preaching the gospel. I'm preaching the gospel. But that is not what? That is not the full terminology. The terminology really in its fullness is the gospel of the kingdom. Is what? The gospel of the kingdom. And we looked at many scriptures to what? To confirm that. That is the gospel of of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. And then it was explained that it means it's the good news of the rule of God. Amen. The good news of the rule of God. Meaning that why we call it good news is that now this gospel has ushered in the rulership of what? Of God. If God is ruling, it's good news. If Satan is ruling, it's not good news. Amen. When Hitler was, was ruling, it wasn't good news. 
He was even oppressing his own people, so it wasn't good news. When a tyrant is ruling, it's no good news. But when God is ruling, because God is love, when love is ruling, it's good news. Amen. And that is what makes the gospel good news. Why is it a good news? Because now God is ruling. And God is ruling over who? Ruling over our, the Christians. When in Romans chapter uh, 10, we confess the lordship of Jesus to, uh, to be born again. That's what we are saying. We are saying that now Jesus is the Lord of my life. And since Jesus is the Lord of my life, he is what? Ruling over me. And if Jesus is ruling over me, then it is good news. Amen. So let's have Colossians. Colossians chapter 1 from verse 12. So when God is ruling, it's good news. Amen. When God is ruling, sickness has to go. Amen. When God is ruling, bondages has to what? Go. Amen. It says, giving thanks unto the Father, which has what? made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Who had delivered us from what? From the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So meaning that before we, we became Christian, before a person becomes a Christian, he is under the rulership of darkness. He is under the dominion of darkness. But now for you, the Christian, you have been what? You have been transferred into the kingdom of God's dear son, meaning that you are in his kingdom. Now in Matthew chapter 6, the Lord's prayer, Jesus said that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. The moment Jesus said that, it means something. It means that this earth is part, or supposed to be part, of God's kingdom. Because there isn't any leader who can bring his policy to a place or a nation which does not belong to him. For you to be, bring your policies into a territory, that means that that territory should belong to you. So if God says that I want my will to be done, my policies, my will to be done, on earth as it is in heaven, then God is saying that earth is in the kingdom of God or is supposed to be in the kingdom of God. But then the person that God put in charge over the earth, who is the first Adam, betrayed God. He committed high treason and sold the earth to the devil. So the devil got dominion over the earth. Amen. And now Jesus Christ came back to buy back the earth. And that's why the Bible says that he bought back what? The field. And that field was the world. So now he has bought back the field. Right? Legally, the earth does not belong to Satan anymore. But Satan is an outlaw. Even though he knows that the earth does not belong to him, you have, you have to come and drive him out and not devoid him of his unlawful rule over people. And that is the purpose of the church. That's why we are here. We are here to enforce our kingdom. Amen. We are here to enforce the kingdom. Amen. So last week we looked at what? At David. And we said that we will continue today. You see, God said a lot of wonderful things about David. Now when we try to look at the character David... We are not saying we should conform our lives to David. The Christian, you are supposed to conform your life to only one person, and that person is Jesus, as we have earlier looked. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. But David, even though he lived in the Old Testament, shows some Christ-like virtues, amen, that we can also learn from. And sometimes, too, when we learn the characters in the Old Testament, we can look at their positive side, but also their negative sides, so that we don't want to repeat them. Amen. And that is why when Paul wrote the epistles to the church at Corinth, he admonished them concerning that, that we should look at the examples of the Old Testament people so that we don't repeat their bad deeds. Amen. For God doesn't change. The fact that we are in the dispensation of grace does not mean that God is saying that sin and unrighteousness is okay. Amen. 
But this David, God said a lot of wonderful things about David. Amen. In Psalm 89, let's look at Psalm 89 from verse 20. God said a lot of wonderful things about David. What to make God say such statement, uh, make such statements about a man. Amen. God made wonderful things, wonderful statements about David. So it means that this David was not an ordinary man. Amen. He, was, he lived a life that was well pleasing to Jehovah. Amen. So we want to look more into what? Into David. God says, says, I have what? I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. Amen. So with whom my hand shall be established. Says my arm also shall strengthen him. Says the enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foe. God says, I will beat down his enemies, amen, before his face, and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. It says, I will set his hand also in the sea, and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also, I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. It says, His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. God is saying all this about a man. Amen. Not a man in the New Testament, a man who lived under the law. Says, if his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my love and kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. So even his children get to benefit because of him. Amen. Says, my covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. Amen. Amen. Look at the words, the words, the content of the words that God says to David. But the Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. Meaning that God did not say this about David because his name was David. Neither did he say this about David because he was the son of Jesse. Neither did he say this about David because he was a shepherd. It means that there was something about this man, this character, that pleased Jehovah. Amen. So if we can learn something about David and apply it to our life, it will be the same thing with us. Amen. God is no respect of persons. So why did he say this about David? Let's also look at 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13 from verse 13. Amen. This David, we are looking at this David. Amen. This David, there was something special about David. And someone said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. And last week we looked at the blunder that Saul committed for someone to say this to Saul. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. Amen. Amen. God is saying that David was a man after his own heart. Amen. But why did he say this about David? Now let us look about what God, Jesus also said about David. Just say something nice about David. Let's look at Matthew chapter 12 from verse 1. Matthew chapter 12 from verse 1. 
Are we happy to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. This King David was amazing. He could sleep with women and still not be killed. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> says, At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were unhungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did? Look at what the master is saying. He says, Have you not they are what? accusing his disciples of what? Eating with unwashing hands. He says that, but he said unto them, Have you not read what David did? When he was unhanged, and they that were with him, these disciples went the Sabbath day at plucking corn, and that was something that the Jew, before Jesus, these disciples will not, will not do that. They will not go and what and pluck corn on the Sabbath day. But then, because they have walked with Jesus, they became emboldened, and they did that. And these elders of Israel came accusing the disciples. But the master, in replying, says, Have you not heard about David? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the shoe bread? He entered the temple. Amen. You know the table of what? Of shoe bread. It says that how he entered into the house of God and did eat the shoe bread, which was not lawful for him. Now, David was a king. He was not a priest. He was not a priest. And the shoe bread, the table of shoe bread was in the holy place of the temple. Now we have read about many kings who did certain things that we were not supposed to do. For instance, if you take Uzziah, when he went and wanted to add burn incense to God, he was what? He became leprous. It was unlawful, but he was punished. Amen. David, also a king, he's not a priest, goes into what? The holy place of the temple, and the master Jesus is, say, is speaking. And if Jesus says something, it's final. Amen. The master says, How he entered into the house of God and did eat the shoe bread, which was not lawful. The master says, It was not lawful, it was not lawful by the laws of God. David was not supposed to do that. Says that it was not lawful for David to eat the shoe bread because he's not what a priest. Says neither for them which were with him, but only for the priest. Jesus says that this shoe bread wasn't lawful for David to eat, but only for what for the priest. But David goes in, he does the same thing. He was he's not punished. Why? Another person will go and do this same thing. He will be stricken down. And you will die. Because this David, like God says, he was a man after God's heart. David knew the heart of God. He knew how to walk with God. Amen. 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 So we are want to look more about David so that we understand more about his heart, the condition of his heart. Amen. Amen. Now let's go to First Samuel chapter 17. Now in 1 Samuel chapter 17, the background of the story was that Israel were now uh, confronted with the Philistines, the, their enemies. And these Philistines were led by a champion called Goliath of Gath. The Bible says that 40 days and 40 nights, this Goliath will come challenging the army of Israel and says, you Israel, bring your champion to fight me. Right? The Bible says that he blasphemed the name of God and also blaspheme the armies of what of Israel. Amen. But no one could go and challenge his Goliath because this Goliath was very big. He was a giant, right? Between around 13, 15 to 20 feet. So this, this guy was very tall. And not only that, he's a huge figure. So even King Saul, who was the most muscular, the macho man of all the Israelites, 
was afraid. He couldn't what? Dare go and what, confront uh, Goliath. So let's start from the verse 20. It says, And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were so afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killed him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. So they told David, the one who is able to have kill this Goliath, the father's family will be free of taxes, no tax. You will not pay any tax. But not only that, David, you also get to marry one of what? The princess. Amen. So that sounded nice in the ears of David. Amen. So the Bible says that, And David spoke to the man that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killed this Philistine? So he asked again, Amen. And take it away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, Jesus said that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So when a person says something, it means it also reflects his thought, his thinking, the way he thinks. Amen. Now this David wants to challenge him. This David was a youth. A youth. And this Goliath is a grown man, a giant. And this David now wants to go and challenge Goliath. But David says that Goliath, who is this Goliath? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Meaning that as long as David is concerned, who is this man who has no relationship with God to what? To defy Israel. David's mind was on his covenant with Jehovah. He says, I have a covenant with Jehovah. This enemy, he has no relationship with God. The Bible says, Paul talking about the Gentiles, he says that before then they were estranged from what? From the common world of Israel. He said that you were godless. Amen. They had no God and had no hope. So David also had this understanding that these Goliath, these Philistines, they are uncircumcised. They are uncovenant people. Amen. But I have a covenant with Jehovah. And if I have a covenant with Jehovah, who is this Philistine to what? To attack me. Why should I be afraid of this Philistine? Amen. Amen. Now, you the Christian, you, are, you, don't just, you don't have just a covenant with God. You are, like as I have explained about, you are not what? In the covenant, but we are rather the product of the covenant. You are not just, this, this David was just in the covenant with God. And that was his big. How much you and I, who are sons and daughters of Jehovah, why then should you fear coronavirus? Amen. Amen. Yeah, why then should you fear coronavirus? You see, the problem, the difference is the mindset. When David was speaking this, there were other Jews who were what? Present. Before David came to the what? To the war scene. The Jews were there. It's not only David who had covenant with Jehovah. All of them had covenant with Jehovah, but they didn't have the same mindset of the covenant that David had. This is the difference between Christians. This is why some Christians die from cancer and some will not die. This is why some Christians will die from coronavirus and some will not die. This is the difference between 
Christians dying from diabetes and some will not die. They are all Christians, but they have different mindset and different understanding of what? Of Christianity. Amen. So this David said, who is this what? Uncircumcised Philistine. Another thing you also have to understand is that it's not that God gave a word to David and said that, David, you know I've anointed you. Come and go and fight this Goliath. No. This David was sent by his father to come and bring food to his three brothers. And when he came, he heard that this is going on. And then in his thinking, he says, but I have covenant with Jehovah. This, this person, this Philistine, they are uncovenanted people. So why should we, should we come and then defy and make mockery of us? So this was not that there was no, there was no any prophetic word. Like some Christians who always want to wait for a prophetic word before they will, be, they will have faith in the things of God. There was no prophecy. There was, it was his understanding of the word. Of the word. Amen. And because he had the right mindset of the covenant, a right mindset of what? Of the, of the word of God at that time, he, had, he acted on that word. Amen. So he says that who is this uncircumcised Philistine that you should defy the armies of the living God? Please, next verse. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killed him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thy heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Amen. So is there not a reason? Says, and he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The, the other brother chastises him. After, after responding, he turns and then he saw that the man was focused. Amen. Then he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard, which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, now let's look at what this David. This David is amazing. Amen. Amen. This David is a youth. Amen. He's a youth. And, and at, that, at this time, David was around 17, 18 years old. But it is just around the time that he was what? He was anointed. Amen. So he was a youth. But the Bible says, and David said to Saul, David comes to a 17, 18 year old youth. Come to the king who is afraid of Goliath and says to, what? to Saul, let no man's heart fail. Because of him, thy servant to go and fight with this Philistine. Now, some of the Christians living in, 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 in these days, if you go and talk like that, they will say you are proud. Amen. But this was what David boasting in the Lord. David, a man having faith in the Lord. Amen. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth. You see, he says the same thing. And he, a man of war, from his youth. Amen. And then he said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Now let's wait here and look at something. There are many Christians that they don't know the ways of faith, amen, and the ways of God. You see, David, before he confronted the giant, he had what? Battle in what? In certain fights of faith. You don't go after the giant when you don't have any testimony, amen. What am I saying? Imagine, let's even take sickness. There are Christians that even they have not used their faith when it comes to even headaches and fever. Every time it's drug, drug. Even he has headache, drug. Every time drug. 
One day when coronavirus comes and the hospital they don't have any medicine or what, any, any cure for them, they know that they are what? On their way. Now there's no way for them, so they have to turn to God. Then they want God to what? Perform magic. It doesn't work like that. Before David would come and fight Goliath, he had to what? Fight a lion. He had to what? Fight with what? With a bear. Amen. So God will what? Will train you from what? From one level to another level. So as a Christian in your work of faith, now that you, you hear about divine healing, when headache comes, you apply that faith in such small matters so that when you work your faith, you persevere your, in your faith on fever, on coughs, and you are getting testimonies, then you see that your faith in that area, what? will grow. Amen. Will grow. But then you, you don't say, oh, headache, I have uh, uh, chloroquine. Or I have chloroquine for, 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 for this, drug, this, this disease. I have this drug for this disease. Then any small thing, you go for drugs. Then one day, you want to what, exercise your faith over cancer. It doesn't work like that. Amen. It doesn't work like that. You have to start from what? From somewhere. Amen. So this David fought with a lion, he fought with a bear, and he had testimony. So he had testimonies to rely on. Amen. So, he said that, and I, and so David says, I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Amen. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. Now, this man couldn't have done this without the anointing. Amen. But at that time, he had been what? Been anointed. And remember, after he was anointed, the Spirit of the Lord came over him. It says, Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he had defied the armies of the living God. Like David said in Psalm 16, he says that, I have placed what? The Lord, his beside my right hand, and I shall never be moved. See, David's mind was always on God. His mind was always on God. As a Christian, the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Your mind should always be on Christ. Amen. Let's go on. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the power of the lion, and out of the power of the, of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Amen. Amen. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put an helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David gathered his sword upon his armor, and he assayed to go, for he, he had not proved it. He had never used such weapons before. Amen. And also such instruments of, of, of war before. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with thee, with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. And he took a staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. Now, why did he take five stones? Goliath was one person, but David took five. Amen. And put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrape, and his length was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Now, David took five stones. But in this story, we are told that he was facing one champion of the Philistines. Amen. Because now it was what? Champion of Israel against champion of what? Of the Philistines. So why didn't David take just one? This also talks about faith. You know, there are some people who say that oh, faith means that you try only once. No, faith, Jesus himself talked about faith. He says that faith also involves perseverance. Amen. Faith also involves perseverance. Faith is not always instantaneous, but sometimes too is what? It, it, it goes about perseverance. Amen. So if this David threw the first one and he, he missed it, he would have what? Use the second. Mm -hmm. If he missed with the second, we have used the what? The third. 
If thou mess with the third, you have gone with what? With the fourth. Amen. And that's why he took more than one. Amen. But one thing that he was sure of that he was going to what? To win. So, and the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained, he despised him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of what? A fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me <laughs> with stars? Amen. So Goliath was angry. Why? Because Goliath had a reputation. He was the champion of God. And how can you come and disrespect me like that? You are coming to face me, the Goliath. Haven't you heard my, my, my name, the story, the stories of Goliath? Then you come and confront Goliath with stones. With stones. When some people even will run away when they have what? They have swords. You are coming to confront him with stones. So it was an insult to Goliath. Amen. So the Bible says that, he said, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staff? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Look at what David says. Amen. Amen. We are looking at David. Who is David? The man after God's heart. Amen. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. He says, you come to me with sword, you come to me with all your ammunitions, but I come to thee in the name of what? Of God. Christianity is a call to walk and live in the name of Christ. As a Christian, whatever you do, the Bible says that we should do what? In the name of Jesus. Do you confront circumstances and problems of life in the name of Jesus? That's not what the kind of Christians they do. Amen. The kind of Christians are the Christians who though they are born again, they confront circumstances by the wisdom of this world. They don't confront circumstances in the name of Jesus. And there is a difference. David here says that you come to me with the ammunition, the wisdom, what? The, the things of the world. The world have their ways of doing things. Why? When they go to war, they use knives, they use swords, right? They use all arrows, they use all weapons of war. But David says that no, I come to you in the name of Jehovah. Amen. He says that I come to you in the name of Jehovah. And look at what he goes on to say. He says, This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand. And I will smite thee, and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Amen. I like that. Amen. Do you like what David said? Amen. David says, My soul shall boast in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, when David said that, heaven. Was God, was God saying that, ah, Gabriel, this guy is causing trouble for us. Amen. Amen. No, not God. God is all powerful. Amen. God is all powerful. Amen. David says that, I will what? I will take off your head and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistine to the bears, the fowls of the air. Now, when David said all these things, the Bible let us know that David said all these things having no sword in his hand. But why did he say that? You see, this man now had the Spirit of the Lord on him. Amen. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saved not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. This point two is very important. Is very important. Now, what did David say to Goliath? He says, you come to me with your ammunition. You come to me with the weapon, your weapons of war. 
But I come to you in the name of what? Of God. I come to you in the name of what? The Lord of the armies of Israel. I come to you in the name of Jehovah. Then he goes on to say, I'm not going to fight this battle with swords. For the Lord doesn't say with what? With sword and spear. Meaning that if you are coming in the name of God, you also have to use God's strategy then. Right? Because you are coming to represent him. You are to, to, to come in his name means to represent him. You don't represent God and use your own strategy to fight his battle for him. But that's the problem of many Christians. They have not understood Christianity. And that's why many of them, they get, they get defeated. Some of them die from sicknesses without even knowing. For instance, now that COVID, this COVID-19 virus is in, many Christians may die even though they are not supposed to die. Why? Because to them, they will say that, oh, we live in the name of Jesus, but they live in the name of Jesus and then confront problems by their own wisdom. They live in the name of Jesus, but confront problems with their own strategies. And it doesn't work that way. Amen. If you are going to confront something in the name of God or in the name of Jesus, you go with your strategies. You don't go to, to, to battle on behalf of God and use your own strategies. And that is what the church have missed. Ask any Christian. You say, that, oh yeah, I know that I live in the name of Jesus. But yesterday, I have not understood what it means to live in the name of Jesus. That to live in the name of Jesus means that now it's not your own ways of doing things. It's not your own what, instructions. Now you do everything based on his instructions. So David had this wisdom. He had this understanding that if for me to go to war in the name of God means that I have to use also his strategies, not my strategy. So if God has not saved by swords and spears, then my faith should not be in swords and, and spears. But what? In what? God's strategies. Says that, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hastened, amen, and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his back and took thence a stone and slung it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth, amen. Amen. So we are looking at David. David, the man after God's heart. When this man came to what, the war zone, David's heart was about God. He saw a man defying and making mockery of Jehovah. As a Christian, when you are confronted with situations, when God's name is being mocked, what do you do? What do you do? Do you take your stand for God? Amen. When you're in a place when they say that, oh, God cannot heal people from sicknesses. God cannot heal people from cancer. God cannot heal people from coronavirus. And you are there. You just keep quiet as a Christian. No, you don't keep quiet. You have to be like David. Amen. When God's name is being mocked at, you are God's representative. You are God's child. You have to stand for God. Because David was a, a man after God's heart. He cared about the things of God. That, that Israel was a nation that belongs to Jehovah. So for anyone to come and mock Israel is the person mocking God. Amen. So if anyone mocks Christianity, it's a mock to, at God. But the Bible says that God is not supposed to be mocked at. Amen. So when you are in a place and God, the word of God is being mocked at, you don't take it for granted. You stand for God's word. Because God is his word. Amen. So these are the things that we are learning from David. He was someone whose heart was what? Sensitive to the things of God. Sensitive to the things of God. So as a Christian, let your heart be sensitive to the things of God. You are not just going to walk in greater grace just because you are a Christian and go to church and sing hallelujah. Amen. These are the ways, the ways of God. You have to know the ways of God, how to walk with the Spirit of God. Amen. Walking with the Spirit of God means that the things of God, especially the Word of God, should be very sensitive to you, should be important to you. Amen. 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 Now let's go and look at 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24. We are still looking at David. Why will God say about a man 
a man who lived in the Old Testament, who was not born again, but God could say, David is a man after my heart. God says that his enemies shall not exact upon him. Neither will the word, the sons of wickedness afflict him. Amen. And God said all these things about the man. He said that if his foes comes against him, I will beat them up. Amen. Meaning that this man had a certain condition of heart. The Bible says, And it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Then Saul took three thousand chosen men out of all Israel, and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats by the way, where was a cave, and Saul went into the cover, went in to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the man of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thy enemy into thy hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privately. Now, this is very important. This is very important. Amen. Now, let's go back to the verse before here. Now Saul was after the life of David. David has become a runaway person. He was always running away for, for his life. Because the king, imagine, imagine, you think about this. Imagine the other kings, they are kings in Sweden, right? They have a kingdom. Or let's say the prime minister of Sweden is after your life. You are in Sweden. And the prime minister of Sweden or the president of a nation is after your life. He has all the people on his behalf. He has all the police, all the institutions on his behalf. And they are seeking to what? To what? To kill you. Now you also know that God has anointed you to do what? The next king. That if this king or this president is, is supposed to have, if he's taken away, <laughs> you will be the next person. But the reason why you are running away for your life is because he's still what, in the hem of what? Affairs. Then you find this King Saul in a cave, alone. That you can do what? Strike him down. You can do whatever you want to him and kill him. And after you do that, all eyes will be turned to you because all everybody has heard that David was an, has been anointed to be the next king of Israel. So let's just take him out. If we take Saul out, David, master, you will be the next. All your troubles will end that day. Amen. In addition, God too even has told David in the past that I will deliver your enemy into your hand. So the servant of David says, and the Bible says, and the man of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee. So God has said this to David in the past. God has said to David, I will deliver your enemy, what? Into thy hand. Then you find your enemy secluded in a, in a cave. Isn't it nice? Isn't, isn't, isn't it amazing? And, and uh, this is the time you have to uh, you, should, you should rejoice and say that oh, Father, this is the answer to the to the prayer. This is the uh, the answer to the prayer. Lo and behold, your word has come to pass. You have delivered my enemy into my hand. Amen. If there are many Christians, what would they say? Oh, my enemy, that which has been delivered into my hand. Oh, that way that has been delivered into my hand. I, I, that pastor gave me a prophecy that is this mother-in-law of mine. That pastor gave me a prophecy that is this mother of mine who has what been causing problems for me. This lack of childbirth is because of this mother-in-law. Today I found this mother-in-law. Can't I kill this mother-in-law so that I'll be what? I'll be free. Many Christians. Oh, the prof, some of the prophets we will tell them. Go and, uh, go and bring her picture. Let's pray over her and, and 
take her out of the way. Amen. Amen. But Jesus said, love your enemies. Amen. Do good to them that why that hate you. Amen. But David, what did David say? He says, when the servant says, Behold, I will deliver thy enemy into thy hand, that's quoting God, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privately. Please, next verse. And it came to pass after all that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. Wow. That's amazing. Amen. This man, see, when God tests you, does it become evident to you? There are some Christians that even when God is testing them, they don't even notice. But the Bible let us know that God has not tempt man, but God tests man. Mm. Though God has not tempt any Christian, he tests us sometimes. But ha, ha, those times that, and many times when God tests you, are you conscious that God is testing me? When a Christian has not been rightly taught the word of God and doesn't understand the ways of God, when God is even is testing them, they don't even know when God is testing them. But David, knowing the ways of God, knowing the heart of God, knowing the things of God, knew that it was a test. Amen. He knew that it was a test. He, he was what? He knew that God has given him a word that is going to deliver your enemy into your hand. But David didn't say that, God, you said that you would deliver my enemy into my hand. I have my enemy now in the cave, so let me strike him. No. The word of God is the most important. And that was so many times I say that even when you get prophecies, you should align with the word of God. When you take your, your eyes of God's word, you can even make mistakes with prophecies, with prophetic utterances. And many Christians, they make mistakes with prophetic utterances because they are not acquainted with God's word. God's word. Amen. So he says, and it came to pass, after that David's heart smote him because he has cut off Saul's skirt. Now this man didn't even kill Saul. He what? He cut off the skirt of Saul, but even he what? It pained David for even doing that. It pained, he didn't even, he, he says he didn't kill Saul, but his heart smote him because he cut off what? Part of the cloth of what? Of Saul. Amen. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid, the Lord forbid, that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Amen. 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 David was a man after God's heart. Now, one thing we have, we have to understand and learn from David as Christians is that as a Christian, you have to have respect for God's anointing. You see, God's anointing is God. So the respect that you give for God's anointing is the respect you are giving to God. Why? Because anything is anything, anointing is consecrated to God. It's holy to God, so it belongs to God. So anything that you do to and God's anointing or something anointed of God, even if it's a vessel, a non-living thing is it means that you are doing the same thing to God. And that's why when even the Philistines went into the temple of God and took the vessels of the temple of God, the Bible says that when they were jubilating, what happened? A hand appeared. A hand, what? Appeared. Amen. A hand appeared. Because those vessels that they took were consecrated, were anointed. God told, remember God told, standing for Moses' time, that they should anoint the vessels in the temple with the holy oil. Anything anointed means it's why sanctified unto God. So it's not even only human beings. Anything anointed is sanctified unto God. It's holy unto God. It's consecrated unto God. How you respond or you treat that thing is tantamount to what? Treating God that way. And David understood that. David was not looking at Saul. This Saul was a wicked man. Please you get that. David was not looking at Saul. Saul was a wicked man. Saul was a bad person. But David says, no. 
I won't look at the person. As for me, I'm going beyond the person. I'm looking at the fact that this person is anointed of God. God, the oil of God has touched his head. Therefore, I will, what? I will show him respect. Amen. So God looks at that and says, wow, this guy is wise. He's a man after my heart. Please, do you get that? So one thing we learn from this is that if you are a Christian, have respect for the anointing. Have respect for the Holy Ghost. Have respect for, for, for what? For God's offices. People that he anoints, he put in offices. You have respect for them. Amen. Because how you treat them, God, to, as far as God is concerned, it translates to what? How you treat God. So it's not about them. It's about what? The fact that they have been what? consecrated, anointed of God. Amen. Now let's go to first the same uh, chapter 26. Chapter 26. Amen. So we are learning about David. Why David was a man after God's house. He had respect for what? The anointing. Now, this is opposite to Saul. This is contrary to Saul. Saul didn't have respect for the things of God and the order of God. He knew that what? I should not do this. Then he goes and, 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 and he will do it. Amen. God will give him so a word. Go and do this. He goes, he does part, he leaves part. He didn't have respect to what? To the things of God. But David had respect to the things of God. It says, And the Zephites came unto Saul to Gibeah, saying, Do not David hide himself in the hill of Hakela, which is before Jeshimon. Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him, to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul pitched in the hill of Hakela, which is before Jeshimon, by the way. But David abode in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul was come in very deep. And David arose and came to the place where Saul had pitched. And David beheld the place where Saul lay. And Abner, the son of Nah, the captain of his host, and Saul lay in the trench, and the people pitched around about him. Then answered David and said to Ahimelech, the Hittite, and to Abi Abisha, the son of Zeruiah, brother to Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul to the camp? And Abisha said, I will go down with thee. So David and Abisha came to the people by night. You see, as we go, uh, thank you, Lord. I will say something which is very important. So David and Abisha came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay around about him. Then said Abisha to David, God had delivered thy enemy into thy hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him, I pray thee, with the spear, even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. Amen. Amen. Abishai was actually the nephew of David. And he says that God has delivered Saul into your hands. He says, let me do it. I will not what? I will not do it even twice. That means I won't even miss on the first what? <laughs> on the first uh, attempt. Amen. But look at what David says. They, and David said to Abisha, destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Amen. Amen. So this, this is the, second, the same thing, meaning that David had respect for the anointing. Look at what he says. He says, who, who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be what? And be guiltless. He says, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. Amen. I remember some years ago, 2014, when I was in UK, I was with some Christian brethren, and they were talking about a man of God. And they were saying something that was very funny about this man of God, and they were, they were all laughing. I was about to laugh, actually, because it was very funny. You know, some people can crack jokes, and then, even though you don't laugh, you want to laugh. 
But the Holy Ghost said to me, don't laugh. So I kept quiet, and all of them were laughing, laughing about this man of God. He says, don't laugh. And I, 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 I didn't laugh. See, sometimes people, Christians are not attuned with their, their spirit for them to what? To be guided. There are sometimes the things that you do. Sometimes you may hear people saying negative things about a man of God. You don't know the person. You don't know all about the issue. You keep quiet for yourself. Example, many years ago when Ben Hinn had his marriage issues, there were people saying a lot of what? Evil things about him. But you don't live with this man of God. Neither do you live in what? In his bedroom. You do know what happens in his in his in his, in his marriage. So why do you what? do you speak? But you, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are just speaking based on rumors. You are not in their family. You don't what? You don't talk. So when you find people saying negative things about men of God, especially things that you don't know about, they are just rumors, you keep quiet. As long as that person really is what? Is a man of God, you keep quiet. Amen. That is a respect for what? For the things of God. Amen. So it says that, And David said to Abishai, Destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him. Look at what he says. He didn't say that Saul will go scot free. <laughs> you get that? He didn't say that Saul will go scot free. Remember, God says, I will deliver your enemy into my hand. But because David knew how to understand of the word, he knew that if God is going to do that, he was going to do it in his ways. And he knew that in God's ways, in God's way, God says that vengeance belongs to me. Please, you get that? But many, many Christians are not taught rightly the word of God, and they don't know the wisdom of God, and they get a prophetic word. God says he has delivered your mother-in-law into your hands. He goes home and then there's even a tea that the mother-in-law is drinking. He just go and put poison in. God says he has what? Delivered her into my hand. Or even he's praying, and he's praying that this mother-in-law should what? Should die. Do you know there are Christians who really pray for their enemies to die? They pray for their enemies to die. They, pray, they have prayer sessions for that. That they meet and pray so that their mother-in-law will die. Some even, last time I was talking to a man of God who, who said that, oh, uh, uh, it was a fa he's, a, he's the father of a cousin of mine. When I was talking to him, he's a, a, a man of God in U.S. So we had, my cousin told me that I'm also a man of God, so he called me and we were talking. He said that my wife was causing problems for me and then I pray that my wife be, die so that I have peace, <laughs> peace of mind to do the things of God. Amen. You see, he's a mature man of God, a great man of God, but just that, you see, he allowed the flesh. You see, he knew that what he was saying was wrong, but he allowed the flesh to do that. So sometimes you should be careful. Sometimes the devil can even, through people that you love, bring problems to you, and you have to watch, to be careful. Amen. I said, David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him. I will leave it to God. I know that he is doing all these things to me, but I will not personally do evil to him. I know that the Lord what, will, will, will fight on my behalf. So David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to, 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 to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. And that's what really happened to, what, to Saul at the end. But David says, it will not come from me. It will not come from me. God says that he will deliver him into my hand. But that same God also says that vengeance belongs to me. So if for God to have said that he will deliver him into my hand, that does not mean that it will break, it will break his other, com other, other commandment. God, God's word says that vengeance belongs to him. So if God says that vengeance belongs to him, and he says that he will deliver my enemies in my hand, he will do it through his word. So that's what he conform to his word. That's why when even we, we get prophecy, still we should what? align it to the word of God. John just said that I've get, got the prophecy, I'll just interpret it what? in my way. Amen. So the word of God is very important. Amen. So David had respect for the what? For the anointing. But now, as Christians, this is what we also have to understand. It's not only men of God who are anointed. Let's go to first. Thessalonians chapter 4. 
It's not only men of God who are anointed. Every Christian has been anointed. Amen. Every Christian has been anointed with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because every Christian has received the Holy Ghost to abide in him or her. John, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, it says, The anointing abides in you. And this anointing will teach you of the truth. So every Christian has to have the anointing abiding in him. So because of that, every Christian is anointed. It's not only what we have anointing for what for, for office of offices, which is not for what for every Christian. But then every Christian has been anointed, because every Christian has the Holy Spirit living in him. Uh, Peter says that how God anointed Jesus Christ with what with the Holy Ghost. So now in Christianity, the anointing you are, you are not anointed with oil. The oil was just a symbol. The true image has come. So the same way Jesus was, he didn't say that how God anointed Jesus with the oil. He says that how God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about what? Doing good and healing. So he anoints with what? With the Holy Ghost. So now that every Christian has received the Holy Ghost into him, living in the spirit, every Christian has been anointed. And he says that, touch not my anointed. So now in, in Christianity, when you, uh, you touch your fellow brother or sister, you are touching an anointed of God. This is what many Christians have not understood. And that's why, remember when we were learning about healing, we looked at the communion. Where God said that because of the way that some were treating their fellow Christian brothers, they were what, dying early. And were what, also getting sick and they were weak. Why? Because they were doing that to God's anointed. So now in Christianity, what you do to your fellow brother or sister, you are doing it what? To God. Amen. It says, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God. And that's why even now, when even you are correcting people, all should be based on love. Amen. When you are doing anything, you're correcting any, any people, everything you do, the motive should be love. So when Paul, for instance, was judging this fellow who committed fornication with a stepmother, look at what he says. The motive was love. He says that I'm doing this, that what? His, bo his body will be destroyed, but his spirit will be saved in the last day. The motive was love. Now, after that brother repented, he told them, don't what? Don't go on despising him. Bring him in. So the motive always should be love. Amen. So he says, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, how you ought to walk and please God. God, he says, this is how we are supposed to walk. You see, we are looking at David, the man who pleased God, the man after God's heart. Then God says that this is how we ought. He says we are obligated to walk this way, to conduct our life this way, so as to please God, so he would abound more and more. We abound more and more in what? In grace. Amen. He says, please, let's go back there. But furthermore, there will beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that ye have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. See, he says, abound more in this. And as you, you, you abound more in this, also you abound more in what? In the grace. Amen. Please, next verse. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Now, please, let's go back to it. Now, there are many Christians say that, oh, they say that now, Christianity means that you should not sin and be involved in fornication. The, the message is going around the world that because of grace, homosexuality is okay. Now, Paul says here that this is the will of God. The will of God. What is God's will? God's will is that even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. So it means that God's will is that every Christian abstain from what? Fornication. Please, next verse. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the last of our concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. Look at what he said. He said the Gentiles, they don't know God. That's why they do that. Why should you do that? When you know God. Amen. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Because, and he gives us the reason. Because what? 
that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. Now, this is telling Christians. He's telling Christians. He didn't say that because you are Christians, if you treat your brother or sister anyhow, it should be okay. He didn't say that. He said that even though you're a Christian, be forewarned that what you do to them, God is an avenger of all of such. Amen. Please, that's verse. It says, For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore, he therefore that despised, despised not man, but God. Amen. Meaning that any time a Christian despises another Christian, God says that in God's eyes, you are not despising that brother or sister. You are despising who? God himself. Who has all, and why is it that you are despising God? It says, because God has given unto us the Holy Spirit. God says that my spirit dwells in these people. They have been anointed. They are consecrated and holy unto me. They are the members of my, like you they are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. They are members of Christ. So now whatever you do to them, you do to me. No wonder Jesus said that in that day, as we are closing, Jesus said that in that day, many shall come to me and say that I did this in your name. I did that in your name. Then he says that, go away from me. I knew you not. He that worketh iniquity. And one, another time he told them that in that day, he will say, you workers of iniquity, stand at my left hand, and you that do righteousness, stand at my right hand. And for the workers of iniquity, you say their charge was that when I was sick, you didn't visit me. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. You didn't treat me well. And then the master said that they will, they will, then they will ask, they will say, but master, when did we meet you? That you were hungry and we didn't feed you. When did we meet you that you were sick and then we didn't visit you? When did we meet you and then you were in bondage and we didn't help you out? Then he says, as you didn't do for what? Your brothers. You didn't do it what? For me. Why? It's because of this. Because now every Christian is anointed. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit. Every Christian has become a member of Christ. Amen. So whatever we do to our fellow brothers and sisters, we are doing it to Jesus himself. And this teaches us how we should live as Christians. That if we also live the same mentality, Right, the same mindset that David lived by, even though this was a man living the Old Testament, he had this understanding. So you also live with this same knowledge, this understanding. Then God too will be pleased with you. Then God will say the same thing about you that this lady is a man, sorry, it's a woman, after what? My own heart. So as we are ending, let us be encouraged and admonished to live what? The Christian life. That the Christian life is what? To copy and mimic Christ. You see, to live with what? With the heart of Christ. Like God says that God does not see like man see it. Man looks at what? At the outward appearance, at the physical. But God looks at the heart. So God bless you and everything that you do this week. May it prosper in the name of Jesus. Amen.